Hello, Tom Lebecki here with the latest edition of the New Theory Podcast. So this is a very special podcast, uh, Mother's Day, uh, 2020. Um, you see the, uh, the COVID edition uh, or in, uh, in quarantine. And so I had some previous guests on. So New Theory, we've had billionaires on, we've had you know, actors, we had different walks of life, right? Everybody has different success factors. But one of the areas that have been particular interest to our audience has been uh, the mafia candidly and um you know we had ramona rizzo, rizzo on which was a granddaughter of lefty guns from uh, uh Roscoe. and right. that kind of gave us a context i think of the 60s and 70s obviously it's hard to get a guy from there now to talk about it so she gave a little bit there 80s into kind of 90s with michael francis which i know you have some comments about which we'll get to um gene brello so 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 we talked about that and john elite in my opinion brought us pretty strongly into the 90s but right. whether it be you know whether it be informers or whether it be the media or whatever after 9-11 it kind of falls off that's where our next guest gene brello comes in gene welcome to new theory podcast how are you doing today i'm good man thank you for having me all right so so that's the thing right so you you are the real deal there's there's not much so we're going to talk about why that is is it good is it bad and, and right. before we start tell us about your formative years you know Tell us about your beginning and what made you you growing up. Um, basically, you know, coming up, um, I was a wild kid and, um, you know, I was in the Italian community. So, um, like I said, the majority of the time, the communities that we grew up in are all mafia influence. And I was related. I was born into a, a mafia. My uncle was Fat Andy Ruggiano. He was yeah. um, one of the most notorious fear captains in Gambino history. And if you really want to break it down, one of the most respected men. Um, you know, I had another cousin of mine that was associated with the Gambino family. He was killed. Um, you know, like I said, it was all around me. All my friends were related, you know, we all came up. So I was grabbed at a young age because of my capabilities and willingness to, you know, use violence. And, um, I really believed in that life, you know, coming up. So that's how more or less I got into it. And it was about the money. Like I always say, I like, I like the money, you know? Yeah. So I want to talk about your core though, because I, I, I want to show you the progression. So did you grow up with your, your mom, your, your parents, with your family? Who did you grow up with specifically? And how did they influence you prior to getting influenced by the mom? Okay, so basically I grew up with my mom and dad till I was like eight years old. And then my dad, uh, they divorced. And I kind of was raised by uh, my mom, my grandparents. And yeah. um, my grandfather wasn't a mafia guy, but he was around them his whole life. Uh, his brother-in-law was Fat Andy, obviously, you know, he was, he hung out with all of them, but he never really got involved, um, more or less because he got locked up, uh, hijacking, okay. uh, interesting hijacking, and, um, my, his, uh, sister, my Aunt Jenny, which is Fat Andy's wife, told, told Andy, no, not my brother, Get, he's not going in, not my brother, so after that, he wasn't allowed to do nothing no more, so Andy made sure he wasn't allowed to, uh, work, work no more, so he kind of, um, drifted out of it, but he was always friendly with them and he always taught me everything and about stuff. And, you know, I kind of um, learned a lot from him. Uh, that's a good woman. So, so yeah. did, you, did you grow up, right? So you obviously grew up into it in a sense, but did you grow up where it was normal, everything was normal, kind of like the mob life and the nice stuff and all that kind of good and bad with it, right? And then the real world was kind of weird or did you grow up kind of like a semi-normal kid and then you saw the trappings of the mob and it kind of lured you in. Well, like, like I said, growing up, you know, we didn't believe in calling 911. We're only allowed to dial it. You know, that's not in our cult. It's just, we weren't allowed. The yeah. cops to us were the enemies. We hated them, you know, um, especially FBI the cops. That was always known that, you know, all our friends' fathers were in jail or who's dead. And, you know, so we just didn't believe in, in cops or anything of that nature. So, the regular civilians to us were just different. You know what I mean? If you say call the cops, if I was like, what the fuck you said? You know, like we just, that's the way we were, you know? So I was pretty much raised as don't call cops, don't, you know. But was it like, hey, Uncle Andy's going away for vacation, you know, because, you know, the time vacation, or, or I mean, was it real deal? Well, like, listen, like, you know, he's in jail. Well, he was, he, he's been in jail before I was born, and then he came home in 96, and we were with him all the time, and then he passed away in 99. But his son, Anthony, um, his, his, his oldest son, Anthony, who um, he always was in out of jail too. And he's my mother's first cousin. And then his son was like, my, is my cousin. We were like best friends. So we were always together. And Anthony, you know, uh, kind of always told, you know, we kind of like look up to him. 
and yeah. he was a mafia guy also. Got it. So he was always around us. So, so this brings you to, you know, the early, late 90s, right, pretty much? Right. Okay, you're what, 18 years old-ish? Or what, you're roughly uh, I think, uh, uh, in the late 90s, I'm about 16 years old, right. Not a minute old, okay. So, okay, so when did you start, like, give us, like, your first, like, set of, set of work, and then, you know, was it mob-related? If not, when did you do stuff? And, you know, I know you had no. a jail. I actually, you see, the funny thing is, is that, um, I first started off selling drugs, like like little things, you know what I mean? And I wasn't involved in the mafia yet. I actually started selling drugs for Hootie, which is, uh, he was a Gambino guy named Anthony Russo. Yeah. And I actually started off with him. And I, um, and I, and that's how I started. I started off selling drugs for him. And then slowly but surely, I started getting uh, worse and worse. And I went from uh, drug dealing to doing stick-ups. And then from stick-ups, I went, that's after, after I got noticed with the violence, that's when they kind of um, took a notice of me, Got and it. they and they grabbed me. So, so that so because I want to I want to appreciate this, and and I'm gonna give you you know I, we talked a little bit, and you know we had some some people on, and just being from New Jersey and being Italian, you're gonna run across people uh, 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 in your life. It just it's the reality of it. So, but you know there was a little bit of you know kind of the movies where the mafia did, <laughs> didn't deal in drugs. I know it's horseshit. But, you know, that's kind of the old standby. Is that super horseshit? Or once you kind of get your butt and you got to walk away from it, walk us through drugs in the mafia. Okay, so that, it's, it's half and half because I'll tell you why. A lot of them will take the money. Here's the thing. They won't protect you. So, like, they'll, they'll tell the drug dealers, oh, we got your back. But when it goes to a sit-down and they find out they're protecting a the drug deal, then it's like, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. But, like, they, but they'll take the money. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the guys in my crew that were straightened out were drug dealers, and they became mob guys. You know, two of them, uh, Pudgy, Nicholas Festa, he was a huge pill dealer, yeah. and he got involved with the mafia because he was getting extorted by the mafia, and then he just became close with them. Same thing with Mike Palmacio, huge drug dealer. Everybody was trying to extort him and rob him, and then he ended up getting pulled in by my people, and they became a member. You know, pay, you know they all, a lot of them start off as drug dealers, some of them, but um, also... Like we were robbing drug dealers, you know yeah. what I mean, and, and terrorizing them. But for the most part, drug dealing is a part of the mafia. Yeah. They they don't want to say it, but it is, you know. So that's a good, that's a good secret, right? So right. so you brought up some brought up some great points, right? So you started selling some drugs, started out that way, and then you were still right. would you say? And my interpretation of that is robbing drug dealers. So give me like, is this like the corner guys? Would you rob stash houses, distributors? Yeah. Well, for the most part, like when we're doing armed robberies, like I'm not going to say we're better than gangbangers, but we just don't do random robberies. You know what yeah. I'm saying? We're not going to just walk up the block and rob a cell phone and a leather jacket. That's not what we're doing. We're getting tips. Yeah. So nine out of 10 times, somebody will tip us off where the money is, what's in the house, what the guy got on him. And that's how we'll go about it. We just won't do it blind. Yeah. You know I mean, we're usually getting tips and, and that's how we get the person. They're friends and family. It's not random. It's actually like... Yeah, and, people are setting each other up. Yeah, and yeah. People just because, like, out of spite, or they want a little like commission. Like, how does that work? Like, if I tip you off, do I get a do I get a commission or I just yeah? They get a piece of well. You see, I did it. I gave I gave them a fair share. So, like, if they gave me a score, we'd split it equally, not yeah. a percent. I would go back to you again when they got something cooking. And generally, these are not the most pillars of the community. There's a jerk offs who want you to fuck over their sister or brother. Right. Or yeah. So, so that's what I kind of wonder though. So. so and this is just an example. What about if you kind of got like the old Italian guys got the ice cream shop, money under the mattress, a super civilian, not connected. You, you know, you kind of you kind of think he's got a few bucks. Maybe his, his elderly wife is home or she's not home. Either way, right? And and like, did you rob those kind of people? Like like, no. like 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 was there ever a time you committed a robbery, and even yourself it challenged your moral ethics, or do you always felt like you were above the rim? in terms of your robberies? If, if that's, it's a, that's a good question because, like I said, um, peop, they when I got locked up, they tried to portray me like that because they were trying to make me look bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's the tactics that they use. But, like, for when they were saying that I was robbing all these people in Howard Beach, I only did three home invasions in Howard Beach, and they were all crime guys. So that's why I laughed. My home invasions were out of, out of the neighborhood on drug deals, but the only three people I robbed in Howard Beach on home invasions were crime people. All the other robberies had nothing to do with me. That was just the state organized crime task force making me look bad. That's all they were doing at the time. So it, it looks bad. So it, it almost corners you where you have to cooperate. 
but not only that, they want the people to hate me. Like I'm this dog. Right. And, and and people that know me knew I wasn't doing it. I was terrorizing bad guys. That's what we did. So when it came out, everyone's like, this is bull crap. You know what I mean? But that's what they do before I cooperated. They wanted to make everyone hate me. And that's that's what they did. So the one score that we did was a banana guy. I was robbing gangsters too. I was robbing mob guys. You know what I mean? I robbed several mafia guys. And um, you know, one, I didn't get it's gonna be in my book. He was actually a captain for the Colombo family. What? I yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I pissed, I beat him, he fought me and everything. And you know, I was 20 years old. Yeah, let's, we gotta ice it. I know it's good for your book, but ice, like, so, so, so give me, somebody calls you up, like, how did it start? How did it, how I was sitting, I mean, I was sitting on this guy because they said he had carried a lot of money in the briefcase. And, um, and uh, um, they had told me who he was. I didn't care who he was. And uh, basically, uh, I sat at him when I was like 20 years old. And I'll be honest with you, he wouldn't give it up. He fought me. And um, yeah, oh yeah. And I almost ended up shooting him. I had to shoot my way out the yard. But we'll get into that. It's in my book. It's a good story. And um, uh, uh, like I said, I didn't care. I had no regards. You know, if you were a gangster or not, you know, I didn't, I didn't care who you were. You know, if I thought you if I thought you had the money, you know, as a bad guy, I was coming to get you. But so, so, wow. Okay, can't wait to read about that. But there had been a time or two that you robbed somebody. You know, you, I mean, we know this. I grew up, you know, in New Jersey. Everybody knows somebody. You know who I am, all that bullshit. But once in a while... You come across, you know, somebody who is serious, right? Did you ever rob anybody and like, oh fuck, you found out that they're a captain or maybe a, a maid guy or a strong associate that's protected? Did you ever find out afterwards? And if so, what went down? No, we 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 had rob we had robbed somebody one time and um uh, he was oh, uh, uh, with somebody and they sent the guy down and when they sent the guy down to talk with us, I says, you know, he's a drug dealer, right? And he says. Oh, I says, well, you're a guy. How you protect me? So right there, I win because you know you're coming down. You can't sit. So if I go get my people right now, if I go get the old man Vinny, and you go to the table and you're talking about I robbed a drug dealer, what are you doing here? Yeah. You you can't protect drug dealers. So it's like you got to know when they're gonna try to stay away in drug money. I'm gonna say it's drug money. So who's lying? Who's not? You know what I'm saying? So it's like you can't protect it. So it, it it's actually a win-win. You know, when you rob drug dealers, the gangsters can't protect them, but they'll make it like they are just to get money from them. But they really can't protect them at the end of the day. Well, so, you, so what's interesting is, and, 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 and chatting with you a little bit, and I saw some of your stories, and tangentially, we have some mutual friends, which, which you and I talked about offline. Um, you were a renegade. I can't imagine that you haven't caused a sit down or two. Just uh, hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, like, give us the closest maybe you got to being in super hot water. And if so, what did you do? Yeah, I actually was. Um, uh, one time, uh, I was sent to beat a guy up because he disrespected uh, Ronnie's sister, and um, that Ronnie, was the guy, Ronnie, G, uh, you're Ronnie Gialonzo. So his sister, I was very close with Judy, and um, some guy called her a fat something by a paw, and um, the old man sent me to throw him a beating. Now I didn't know that his uncle was Conrad, a skipper for the Genovese family. So me being a nut job, I sat on the guy for two days. I couldn't get him. I got mad and I just went into his house when the door opened and I beat him up in his house with a billy club. Right. Beat the shit out of him in front of the whole, in front of everybody. And um, what ends up happening is that uh, basically the Genovese family didn't like that I did it because it was in front of his mother. I beat him up with a baton. And then when I came out, I smashed his car up too. So um, at the end of the day, uh, this is when I knew my name was really out there. Barney, who's the boss of the Genovese family, called me a walking time bomb. I and uh, yeah, and they actually wanted to get me. So my, the old man had to sit for that, Vinny, and Vinny had to explain to them, you know, he disrespected my niece. It's not going to, what do you think this is? He's going to disrespect my niece and nothing's going to happen to him because he's, he's your nephew? It don't work like that. Right. So basically, they want, they, if Bonnie got my name in his mouth, he's mad. If it went that high, right, right, you know, right, right, right. he's mad. So that was, the, that was the closest I came to uh, possibly someone really making a move on me over something I did. Wow, so... So, and, and this actually is good because you had sort of link. Okay, so you're doing a lot of stuff. And right. then you had a first stint in jail. But your first stint in jail, you, I believe you weren't like super connected. So give us, would you get arrested no. for it? How was jail like? Um, I was actually arrested with my grandfather for a kilo of cocaine. Me and my grandfather had a direct sale of, coke of a kilo. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was 18 years old and right down, no bail. Yeah. And um it was pretty crazy, man. I was telling them how bad Rikers Island is. It's no joke, man. You know, you really, it's really, really violent, really dangerous. And you, uh, 
it will definitely make you a believer. You know, that place is not over exaggerated. It's extremely violent. Wait, and so, it's, hold on, hold on. I don't want to cut you off, but, but so when you bought it, I mean, that, that at the time had been 30, 40 grand at least, right? Um, I think I was getting it for like, I think we were selling it for 34,000. We were getting it for like 26 or something like that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. And then, yeah. so if you don't mind me asking, like, was it from an Italian guy? Was it from cartel? Was it from the No, I got, it, I got it from a Spanish friend of mine. And um, I actually went to Hootie. This is funny. I went to Anthony Russo. And he says, Gene, don't do it. Cops buy kilos. I said, nah, man. And he's like, he was right. He says, don't do it. He kept telling me. I was like, no, Hootie, give me a brick. I said, it's good. He goes, Gene, don't do it. Cops buy kilos. And, I, and, and so I, and it always, that always stuck in my head that he told me that. And um, it ended up that uh, – it was a guy named Danny Marcha. He had set up my grandfather and he was working with the police. Yeah. Shit. So now you're, yeah. you're young and in Rikers and listen, like, I, I, and I'm being respectful as possible. Like you're from like Queens, you're from Howard Beach and there's a certain level of toughness. I, I, trust me, I wouldn't want to talk to a lot of Howard Beach dudes, but you're going to Rikers, which is like the same thing. Different. Right. So that's how that went down. Well, you know, like I said, I'm a wild guy, but you know, you get more wild because um, it's just chaos. So you yeah. gotta, I gotta adapt. You know, I'm not gonna be a victim. So basically, you know, I got into it a lot. They jumped, I got jumped, and all kinds of stuff. And then eventually, they started liking me. And I, I me and the gang members always got along. I had a lot of them working for me in the street. I always got along with the gang members. And yeah. they don't consider, they don't consider Italian people white. They consider us other. Uh, they say you're not, say you're not a white man. You're Italian. That's how they look at us. All the or the blacks and the Spanish. They don't look at us as white boys. Interesting. So, yeah. okay, so you get out and then, you know, get back and, 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 and I, I, I'm interested in the business aspect. So let's treat this like a business for a second. You get out of jail, you get back with your crew. Give us your streams of income. Like what was your steady stream? Like loan sharking? What was your, right. what was the different revenue streams and what, what right. kind of so, that looked like? Right. So basically when I was full blown a uh, mob guy, I was uh, a huge loan shark. I yeah. had like 150,000 out in the street. Um, okay but I had it out for my boss. So I get the money at one point. So I make money on it. So I was making like 20 some hundred a week, just off loan money. Really? And then I had, so and then I had trust you. Here's 250 K cash. I well, no, you don't do it like that. It's just whenever I need money, I'll go get it. So he's away at the time. So I'll say, Oh, I need 5,000. I'll go grab 5,000 and I'll go give it to the person. And I put it on a list yeah. and it, over the year it accumulated to like a quarter million dollars. And that's how much I had out with him. And I was, um, and then I, I had a big half sheet with sports. So I would get a lot of customers on my half sheet and I'd make some thousands. I was pulling in probably five to 10,000 a week, like I always said in my high. And I was doing like 30,000 a month, a little over that sometimes. And then that's that on the books. It's like, yeah. so you're in the top 1% of earners. Now, can you spend freely or, or you know, like, you have a BMW? I always, cars? I never owned anything. I always leased cars. Um, all my, you know, I lived in a regular apartment. I didn't have a big house, you know, that stuff. And um, that's how I did it. You know, I would spend, I was a party guy, so I would go out a lot, you know, and I like nice clothes. I go shopping every day and jewelry. And that's how I was. I just lived like it was never going to end. So that, yeah, like, that was like in Manhattan. Was that still like the lime, like Palladium days or those days were done? Like, where did you go out? No, I was going more like Long Island clubs or, uh, yeah, we go to the city a lot, you know, or I go to Greenhouse or I go to One Oak, spots yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. And, um, it was pretty, I had, I had a good time. I did. I had, I had two cars, I had a social club, I had an apartment, you know, I, I, I had everything. I was, I was the guy for a little while. Now, now, during that little run, you're making a few bucks, you're connected, so like you're somewhat untouchable, right? Somebody, you know, basically. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say untouchable, but, you know, um, I was speeded. So, you know, I was one of the guys they didn't want to have problems with, you know. Yeah. I, was known to play, I was known to play with guns, you yeah. know what I mean? That was my thing. I loved guns. I was pretty violent with them and that's 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 you know people really didn't want no problems with me now now um john elite who you partner with on your show we'll talk about that a little later is um uh, is he 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 broke it down where you know generally you're a hitter which is your muscle or you're an earner and he was a very few that was both candidly were you more of a hitter an earner a hybrid what was well, like i said i'm not, i don't want to like um make myself bigger than what I, what I am. I'm, I'm just going to tell you the truth. John A. Light was that. He was both. He was a killer. He was an earner. Me, I wasn't a big earner, but I made money. You know, yeah. at one time I was bringing my boss probably, you know, I was probably making him at one time probably 20000 a month, which is not crazy money, but it's compared to some other people. But at one time I was... He has like 10 guys under him. So he's making 
So, probably more than that. Yeah, he probably had more than that. But I mean, 20, yeah, Ronnie was making about 30 to 50,000 a week. But I mean, I was bringing him with loans and sports about 20,000 a month average. But um, I was more violent. I, my, my thing was more of, I was a, I was a violent guy. That's where, that's where my role mostly was for him. I did, I did go with money, but I wasn't a multimillionaire. Yeah. But um, my thing was more of henchmen. Yeah. Got it. Right. Now, I don't know if you would even know this, but were you close to becoming a made member? Like, did, yeah. like were you group? I was, actually, I was actually supposed to go in in 2012, okay. but I didn't because Ronnie G said he wanted to be there because he was in jail. And then when he came home in 2013, uh, Vinny was trying to put me in, and then he said that, oh, Ronnie told him, oh, we got to wait because I don't want Gene to go on my list because then he can't hang out with me. So I'm with the guy every day. So when I become a member, I go on his list. He's on federal parole, and I can never go near him again. See, if I'm not a member, he could pull it off where I can still hang out with him all the time. That's what, that's the, what government, he, the government knows once you get your – is it a government thing? The day. They know the day of. What? Literally. Yeah. I don't know how. They do. Yeah. They literally know the day of. It's crazy. So, so much for secret society. All right. So, right. so, 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 for whatever reason, he held you. Yeah, maybe political. Now, now, what happens there? Like, so, so, what does it mean? And this is why I wanted to have you on you for many reasons. But what does it mean? And I give you the good and the bad. What does it mean to be a made member today? Like, if you became made, what does it really mean? Where is it? How is Back in the eighties, back in the eighties and seventies, it meant some. Nowadays, it means nothing. Yeah. Um, basically, I wanted it because I felt like I deserved it, and yeah. I felt like, you know, everyone else felt I deserved it. People used to come up to me and thought I was straightened out, and they'd be like, "You're not done yet." And I says, "No." He goes, "What the hell?" He goes, "All these other guys are in. You're not." He goes, "Yeah." But how's that? You do everything. I says, "That's the way the cards fall," you know. Yeah. But um, uh, um, nowadays it means absolutely nothing. You know, we have guys that are getting straightened out now that I could tell you that never did anything in their lives. Nothing legitimately nothing so it really means nothing anymore it's just a title and you basically have your own crew but it's really it's really not good to be made because then you have mandatory kickups yeah. you have to follow a lot more rules yeah. and um it, it's actually better not to be a, a member to be honest with you that now now it's interesting because i i, I want i want to wear your hat at the time so let's just say the sake of argument i'm a jerk off i'm a nobody and then maybe through my uncle or whatever i get my button you don't it dilutes it for you and makes it not as important because you kind of have protection anyway. Oh, right. So, so yeah. Right. So like I'm saying, like that's the whole problem that a lot of guys that were really out there doing stuff. We don't like the guys that are getting involved that never did nothing. Like we had a guy in my crew. His name was Nicholas Fest. They call him Pudgy. And um, like I said, I was good friends with him, but the kid was literally getting robbed all the time, abused. I mean, he gave Ronnie ten thousand a week, so Ronnie loved him. So Ronnie would tell me to protect him like he's his son. I all right. So the kid was literally a, a, um, a victim and they ended up making him because they felt like they had to, you know, after so many years of him paying, yeah. he never been into a fight. He's never swung his arm. He's never shot nobody. He's never killed nobody. He's never robbed nobody. He's never done nothing except for give Ronnie money. That's all he's done in his life. So, and, yeah. and people actually like used to make fun of him. You know what I'm saying? He was like known as a joke. He's 75% Irish, 25% <laughs> Italian. Yeah. His last name's just Italian. He's mostly Irish. So it's like, it don't matter no more. They just put in whoever, you know what I mean? Just to fill slots. So, yeah. All right. So, so and I, I'm just going to give you my understanding. Just, again, talking about John Lee and so forth. The Bananos got, like, really kind of screwed up a while ago. We keep it simple. I guess there was a commission or whatever. You know, kind of got removed. And then Joe Messino was, like, a major boss in Queens hooked up even like Gotti and so forth, brought it back to a, like a point of, hey, we're, we're players again. And then the boss flip, and I believe that was under your, you know, under your, your time. So walk, so walk us through that. That had to be crazy. And give us, give us, were you, were you Actually, on the rise, on the decline, and then what happened? Right, because right. like when he flipped, like 10 other captains flipped. So the whole family was pretty much crushed. I mean, it was like a, we were almost as bad as the Colombo family when they went bad. They're actually, they have nothing left. But at the one point, the Bonanno family was like the laughing stock too because Joe Messino down, Joe Messino, the underboss flipped too. And all the captains, so the whole family was wiped out. And they were, and it basically gives people like us, like, what the fuck? If they're going to cooperate, 
you can't trust anybody. Joe Messina's like, he was like the Don, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it, it, and, and at the one point, a lot of the other families were saying that they didn't recognize anybody that came under Joe Messina. So if you were straightened out under him, he straightened out a lot of guys. So everybody's flipping out saying, how are you not going to recognize me because you came under a rat? So basically they're trying to say they won't recognize his members no more. So that, that, that went on for a little while and then it stopped, you know, um, uh, uh, I believe we didn't have another street boss. I remember 2011, we got a guy named Tommy, Tommy D. And that was the first street boss we had since Joe Messina. He was actually acting boss for Mikey the Nose while Mikey the Nose was in jail. Yeah, okay. Mikey the Nose was always the boss, yeah, yeah. but he, he just appoints people for the street and he appointed the guy Tommy. Now, now, what fascinates me about organized crime is the structure. And it's been around 400 years. And frankly, I think it will be around for other points, maybe not in some capacity. But how important was it to have a leader, even at your level? Was it important or you didn't care or it actually did a little bit to show your colors, feel good about an organization? How important was having leadership uh, in, in the equation? You mean like like to have like a guy like... Yeah, obviously like, listen, I'm doing dirt here, maybe even for Durrani or for Vinny, but like, right. like you had a street boss, did you feel a little better? Like, hey. Right, because, you know, you know, you know like when you're in that lifestyle, you know, like I said, you know, when someone does something, it falls on everybody. So it's like when he did that, it made everybody look bad. You know, everyone's like, oh, this guy, this family's a joke. You know what I'm saying? So we didn't, re it took years to rebuild, man. I'm telling you. And it didn't, the Bonanno family didn't really come back to like 2012, 2013. They were fucked up for like seven, eight years over it. Yeah, it was on the come for a while, right? After, like, like, uh, I heard, like before he ratted, things were actually, and you might have caught some of that. I heard things were actually fairly good. Well, actually, at one time, probably Joe Messina was like the next John Gotti, you know, except not flashy like him. But that was, the, you know, that was, he was like the guy, you know what I mean? And uh, when he cooperated, that was just like, everyone was in shock, you know, nobody could believe it. What was the government strategy? Because the whole goal is to get the boss, right? After you get right. the boss, who is there? So well, the strategy there? Well, think of the message that it sends. If Joe Messina could flip, that shows you there's no loyalty in that life. You know, think about it. Sure. Think of that message. They, at the end of the day, we used to say, how do they give this guy a deal? He ordered all the murders. He's the one that's calling the shots, but it sends a message to the, to the mafia. There's no loyalty. Look, your bosses are ratting. Yeah. So it's like, it's a good message to send to the people. Like, look at this. It's a joke. You know what I mean? How he's going to look up to somebody. He's not taking his time. You know what I mean? And, then so, what, and what does it mean to like the, the neighborhood, like a fence of Paris, like a Howard Beach, like a Heights, where there was historically an organized crime presence, and now right. it's waning. It, you know, we're starting to see maybe we're starting to see maybe drugs on the corner. We're starting to see maybe stuff that would happen that never would happen in a million of years. Of course, you know. So so it did affect the normal people. The I was I was just talking to somebody and then everyone in my area is like hooked on heroin and doing drugs now. Like back in the day, like that was not going on. If you were selling heroin in that neighborhood or you were getting kids hooked on drugs, you might have got killed, shot, beat up, chased out the area. You know what I mean? So nowadays it's just uh, it's bad. Everybody's doing drugs and. Is no one over there to protect the neighbors no more, you know? But you caught, like, some serious people, meaning, like, you were working, you know, closely with Vinny Asara, who was the original Goodfellas guy. Um, right. So, like, the real times of heist of what you know. And then he also kind of sat you down, like, almost like a mentee, and walked through Mafia protocol. So walk us a little through, through that as well. Well, he would always teach me things. And, um, like I said, he knew I was going to be – he wanted me to become a member. And uh, I was really close with Vinny. And – um the only reason why I got so close to him is because when Ronnie was in jail, he told me to report to Vinny while he was gone. Yeah. So I would answer, so I would work with Vinny a lot, but Vinny took a liking to me because I rob, yeah. I shoot, I be, I'm like him, I'm violent. That's what he likes. He likes real street guys. So, you know, so it was basically, he knew he could send me to do whatever I would do it. And um, uh, that's how he started showing me the rules and breaking down everything to me and making me learn everything. Like Ronnie, Ronnie taught me a lot also, but Vinny taught me, Remember, Vinny was a captain on the committee, and Vinny was supposed to be the boss several times. He just didn't want it. Yeah. So he goes back to the 50s. So there's nothing you could really what, tell that. Movie. What are some of those rules? You just, just out of curiosity. What I mean, like, you know, like as far as membership, um, you know, a, a, a friend can never put a hands on another friend. Um, you know, you, you can't introduce yourself as a made member. You know, you can't go up to somebody and say, I'm a made guy. You to another guy, you have to be introduced. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of politics with this stuff. Um, he was just teaching me everything. Once you put a joke of poker machine in someone's social club and it's from the Bonanno family, it can never be another family's cl social club ever. Oh, shit. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot of things you got to learn, like, you know, um, uh, just a lot of politics and a lot of stuff. You know, any mafia family, like I said, uh, 
it, it, it's it's certain rules you have to go by, and he was just teaching me a lot of things, you know. Interesting. So, so never sleep with a made man's wife, you know. Never, uh, you know, a lot a lot of things. Got it. So 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 just to filter correctly, Fernando's kind of got beat up, obviously, because of Messino. You know, Columbo's, we know, like the war and that kind of stuff. Um, as I understand, though, the Gambino's kind of resurrected a little bit because a lot of Sicilians came over. There was a big Sicilian faction, big into heroin, big like big money makers. So, like, I know, like, you know, Howard Beach has historically been a breeding ground, more the Gaudis, I know, but a breeding ground for the Gambinos. So, like, the Gambinos, as far as you're concerned, were they legit or they're still kind of scrambling as well during your time? Uh, I mean, like I said, they have, they're legit, but um, they have a lot of cooperators, too. And um, I, think, I think, for the most part, all the mafia is falling apart. The only one family that's still kind of good is the Genovese family. They're the only one. And, and pretty soon, they'll be falling apart. But... Like I said, they don't have no violence. So they really ain't facing no time. So, you know, like when you don't do violent crimes, nobody's really cooperating over five years. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. When you're doing the crimes I'm doing, you're getting 40, 50, 60 years, you know, you don't know where someone's going to be at. And they're like, you know, you don't know what they're going to do. Well, so you're, 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 you're an intelligent guy. You, you, you navigate the system. And, and this is conversation not for 2020. It's probably been the navigation system, uh, conversation for 30s. Heritage, Luciano, you know, Genovese. And, and grew in the, there's like, four, I suppose like four, they don't even know how many members. And members don't even know who other, like they did it right, right? And I'm not, right. not justifying organized crime. I'm not saying right. they're good people. But what I'm saying is um, they did it right in the context of they survived and they're doing well, right? And you have right. maybe living off reputations or oh, they're the mafia, so I'm scared. Well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a perfect example. For, for instance, like a guy like um, John Gotti Jr., right? Um, we're going to a perfect example. He he cooperated with the with the federal agents. Right. Now he, he refuses to admit it that he he says he sat with them. Let me break it down to you. And, I, and I'm not trying to target him. I really didn't know him like that. I knew his family family members very well. He claims that he's not a cooperator, but he sat with the feds. It's proven that he sat with them. He admitted that he sat with them, but he said he told them all lies. Now in our world, right yeah. now on the street, once you agree to sit with them, you're considered a rat. That's one. Sure. Two, God forbid you talk to them in any way, shape, or form. That's a death sentence. So what, what he what he's saying is so ridiculous. You're gonna sit here and say you're not a cooperator because nobody got arrested, but you tried to get people arrested. So it's like you're not making no sense. That's why I just say keep it real and say what you are. He lived off his father's name. He never did nothing without Johnny A. Light. That's the one who did all his dirt. Yeah. So it's like that's another thing. You get people that live off the. The, the names of their fathers and they'll try to play the role, but they really have no business being there. Same so, thing. Yeah. yeah same, thing, same thing with Michael Francis, Michael Francis. So I, you know, I don't know the guy. I knew his nephew. I had an altercation with one of his nephews, but um, the guy only talks about a gas scam. Now I understand, you know, he was a capo regime, whatever he calls himself or this stupid shit or whatever these, these movie lines he uses. Um, <laughs> He only was in the mafia because of his father. You know, without his father, like I said, he'd be working in a gas station. So literally working in a gas station, not scamming a gas station. So it's like, you know, I, 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 that's all I have to say. You're right. They live off these names and it goes back generations and they really have no business in their life. So the mafia right now, it's tarnished pretty much. The five families in, in New York is pretty much dead. That's, but so, so, so that, that's my question. And I actually want to ask about other groups because you're also interested, interesting because just like John A. Light, you, you, you knew a lot of different people. So, so if, if for the most part, and again, this is a conversation for 2020, it's been years. If, right. if Genovese has been strong, right? Why didn't the other four groups operate like that? Like that's, that, I don't get it. I, I can't answer that. But like I said, they had, I guess, good leadership. And you know, not only that, um, uh, they don't, but here's the thing. When you don't have no violence, you're not going to have really no cooperators. And that's the God's honest truth. When you start shooting people, killing people, and hurting people, that's it. The, the, the guideline, it's all about the time because a guy facing five, if I knew, if I knew a guy that would cooperate over three, three to five years, you had no business in the street at all. You know, that's nothing to me. I can do that in my head. That's nothing that time. Now, when, you, when guys are looking at 50 years life, you don't know where somebody's at. So that's why, so that's why the Genovese family, you know, you, they get, they get a 50 man indictment. There isn't one assault on it. It's just all loan shark and sports and bullshit. So nobody's really cooperating, you know? But with the other families, yeah. it's violence. And then that's everybody just starts, you know, nobody wants to die in jail. That's the truth. Now, now, uh, and then what I, I, you know, 
chat with you a little bit uh, offline and then also saw, saw some of the podcast. But you also, you know, you dealt with Albanians. I know you dealt with the drugs and that kind of stuff. How did the other, like, so, so did other groups like the Albanians, Russians, Chinese, et cetera, did they kind of take over a lot of the Italian mafia turf in terms of business? Or is the Italian, like, like give us a landscape of organized crime today in Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens. Give us, like, uh, uh, how that it, it, it looks. It's all mixed. The Alba the, see, the Albanians is more uh, with the Italians, like now. They used to not like each other, but now they're all friendly with each other and they deal with each other. But the Russians, I really never dealt with them. I really don't know too many people that deal with them. And plus, they do that... Uh, women trafficking shit, which a lot of people don't go for that. You know I mean? We're not into that whole hurting women and children shit. So other organizations are into that, like the outer, like the Russians and uh, other cultures. But um, for the most part in the five boroughs, Albanians and Italians are kind of like sharing territories, you know, as far as when I was out there, yeah. they kind of partner up with the Italians a lot, you know, and that's, that's how it is. Yeah. Like I, and you said, like, just, just like, you know, my parents were in the fifties, they were hungry. And then, you know, me and I, but I'm not hungry, but I'm not going to do stuff that they do per se. And now the Albanians are hungry, so Italians will utilize them to smart rather than try to fight. They, right. They, they partner with them. They join, right. The Albanians are wild guys. Most of them that I know are all nuts. They're all so, nuts, most of them. Right now. So you, you had a few stints in jail. Give us your last stint. And then I'm interested, interested to hear of uh, that point you're connected. You're super connected, but you're a tough guy. Like, you handle yourself, but you're also right. connected. And, but you're in, like, state, right? You weren't even federal, correct? Hey, yeah. Okay, so, so, so you're Gene Brello, you're in state. No Italians. No Italians. But like, I, I can tell you now, you look like a hooked up guy. Like, I can look at you and be like, you're hooked up. There's, right. there's a blood, a crib. Uh, yeah, they respect that or like, fuck them, we don't care. How, how does, that, how does well, that work? Well, they knew I was doing a lot of stuff in the street, so they wanted to get down with me in the street. They wanted to work for me. Yeah. So a lot of times they, they want, I would. I would have a lot of gang members doing stuff with me in the streets. So um, when I was in jail, you know, I was coming out in like articles and stuff like that. So they knew kind of, and I was always cool with them. You know, I, they knew I wasn't a punk. You know, I was, I was looking out for people in jail, you know, kids that were coming that couldn't handle themselves. I would get a little table for them. So they had a place to sit down and stuff like that. Cause the gang members respected me. Yeah. So, so you were smart. So you assimilated quickly. Now, why has it, so that's the other thing too. And, 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 and I'm not just saying this, but, that organization's been around for a long time, right? But other groups, like even gangs, have not really graduated to take over. Um, you know, it, so so how does the future look? You think, yeah, there's always going to be a Italian mob a weekend. You think it'll be extinct? I think it's going to go. I think it's going to go eventually because the kids coming up now, they're not even interested in that. They're more playing Xbox, doing drugs. They're not really into like the street. You know what I mean? Ninety yeah. babies is kind of like different now. You know, it's like. 80s babies was the last of like not old school but still still kind of old school you know what i mean 90s babies is just a whole different generation everything's the phones and internet it's all it's it's totally different now there's really nothing coming up when the old timers stop dying that's it it's a it's a wrap now now you now we're gonna include a little bit you you were on your third sit in jail you know you haven't been uninformed you were sitting tight you, you were battle tested frankly um right. You know, and what kind of brought you to to cooperate and give us those series of events, and then what was that moment? No, I never, I never said it. I never said this before, but it was almost out of spite. Okay. You know, I got to say, like, I wanted to change. I did. I was sick of the life, but I hated Ronnie G so much that I was hoping that I could just cooperate against him. But it don't work like that. <laughs> you know, I hated the guy. I grew so much hatred from that. I did everything for this man, and he turned on me. I literally would take a bullet for this guy. And he turned on me over nothing that I, I literally almost did it out of spite. You know, I wanted to see everything, you know, I just wanted to, that, that's really what happened. But then I really started seeing also sitting down, like nobody really does care. You know, everyone turns on you. Um, uh, you, you know, as soon as you go in jail, everybody forgets about you. It's not like there's no loyalty. Uh, people are trying to rob your stuff or it just, they think, oh, he's gone now. Who gives a fuck about him? And that's just, it's just horrible, man. I devoted myself to people that didn't give a fuck about me. Now, here's the thing, though. I am if you're comfortable chatting about this. On any interviews, I don't believe I've seen why you and him beefed or what, why, uh, you know, hey, this is what Ronnie did in order for me to lose faith. Uh, are, you share, are you comfortable sharing that, or is that something that... Um, well, for one thing, he didn't, he didn't practice what he preached. So he would send me after people, and then he would become friends with them. So he had me try to shoot a guy for him while he's in jail. The guy knows it's me. 
And then when he comes out, he's hanging out with him. I said, how the fuck are you going to bring this guy around me? You just shot me and I'm trying to shoot this guy for money. Oh, don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about it. The guy probably hates me now because you sent me to get him for you, but now you're hanging out with him. All these guys, when he went to jail, Mike Palmacio and Mike Patagona turned on him. Patagona fucked him over on money. They were all abusing him. They didn't like him. Uh, they were talking bad about him. I was the only guy that stood by him when I came home. And when, when, they, when he got out, he became friends with them again. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. I'm like, you told me to stay away from them, all this stuff. Palmacio's this, Patagonia's no good. And now you're with them. Now, now, now you're friends with them again. You tell me to stay away from them. So I started seeing his ways. And then he started becoming a little envious of me because, remember, he's got all the money. Yeah, yeah he's a millionaire. I, I understand that he didn't like the fact that people feared me and that the fact that I was becoming a real mob guy. And he, he didn't like that. And I thought he did. He didn't. So basically, he was basically, I feel like, trying to push me away purposely. And I seen it, and he was giving me ultimatums that I got in my book, what he did to me. And he basically tried to make me pick, and I didn't like what he did. And then he started talking down to me in front of people and trying to belittle me all of a sudden. And he's supposed to be like, like my guy. Yeah. And I ultimately robbed him for like $300,000, and I went to Florida. That's the truth. And I declared war on him. Yeah. Really? Yeah. With your K and bolted to Florida? Well... 250000 in loan money that he didn't know where it was. I, I, I had his list. I fucked him on it. 250 Gs. Well, hey, I'm, I'm here. Whoa, this is a biggie. I'm here for Ronnie. Give me the it's fun. the first time I ever told anybody this. Yeah, people know about the story, but 250 Gs got out in the street. I told him, go find it yourself, jerk off. He didn't know where a dollar was. And then, and then, then I robbed him for like 50K cash. And then, mm -hmm. he, so you blast to Florida, right? And, and Florida, I, I know it's open territory, but there's some guys that way, you know, lingering around. Did you go to the guys that you knew because you didn't give a shit? Well, here's the thing. Ron, Ron, Ronnie G was very hated. So everyone still talked to me. I was talking to Palmacio while I was in Florida. <laughs> That's a guy in his crew. They hated him. So he didn't even know that. I would talk to everybody. I was talking to Pudgy, everybody. They were in the circle. They all hated the guy. They couldn't stand him. They had no choice. He was, he was you know, his family is the whole structure. Right. So they all don't like him. I used to talk to everybody. Everyone's like, Gene, I wish he was gone and you were here. Everyone, you know, I was like, listen, fuck him. I'm done with him. He go collect his money himself. I declared basically war on him. You know, me and him were like hating each other. So that's really what happened. That was that was the truth. So you know, that's me just being nuts, and that's what happened. I don't let nobody fucking. So it's no wonder why it's not lasting because you have a and he he was a captain, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you have a captain, and theoretically there should be a soldier, and then you. So right off the bat, like rank is kind of broke because you you. Well, you also had in all fairness. You had unbridled access, like a, like a guy like you. Oh, uh, I ran, I, I ran all his sports businesses. I ran his big sport. I ran all his money. You know, I collect all his money. I met up with people that uh, I wasn't even supposed to meet up with. Uh, for him, I used to give messages to people. Then he used to talk in front of me openly, which uh -huh. is not even allowed. You know what I'm saying? He would talk right in front of me. I met the boss in his in the hospital visiting Vinny, Tommy D. He introduced me as, oh, he'll be one of us soon. Talking about like, that's how he looked at me. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm saying. Like, this is how they looked at me. You know, of course, people are going to talk shit now because they're mad at me. You know, oh, he's bullshitting. Everyone knew what I was doing. I protected people. I looked out for people. I, I hurt people. I robbed people. I did everything. But I was a real gangster at one time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And <laughs> that's what I was. For my time in my area, I was I was the, I was one of the worst guys. And, you know, that that's what it was. He, I thought, liked that, but he didn't. He didn't like that. So... So hold on. So and I want to I want to get some context too though. Is it like hey you know he was like at one point a mentor, sat in the backyard, smoked cigars, go to the christenings or weddings, or was it church and state? Listen, I'll meet you after eleven p.m. early morning. With Ronnie? Yeah. How was your relationship? Oh no, I I basically lived in his house. Wow. It was different. Yeah, I ate by the house every day. They had a spot for me at the table. Uh, his kids were like my brother and sister. I took while they were in jail. I made sure everything was. I was like literally devoted to them, and um, that's why I was so heartbroken when he did that to me when he came home. Um, literally, I mean, they were like my family. Wow. Like I like I like like was with them twenty four seven. So and the funny thing is, is that everyone thought like I'm the one that cooperated first. No, people know now. They had guy wearing a wire in their crew. They didn't even know one of his best friends wore a wire on them for three years. So it's like nobody knew nothing. Nobody knew this. You know what I'm saying? So and then you have a multiple other guys that were cooperating on the case. I was actually the last guy to cooperate. And nobody knew that. 
but they named me as the poster boy, which I'm not justifying. I still cooperated, but I was like the last guy on the case. They already had the case built for years. So it's like, you know, they all were blaming me. And then when it all came out and he seen his best friend was on the internet wearing a wire, he felt so stupid. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's, this is what happened. Everyone hated him, you know? So. And bad leadership. No, it's, it's like, this is, this is like, this isn't just like a mob. This is just, if you have a business, right? You need the right leadership, yeah. the right protocols. Right. Your people treat them with respect. Uh, right. So we're going to conclude soon, but but um, so I, I just this is more of a newer thing. You know the rapper Six Nine. I'm assuming you heard of him, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he rolled on. You know his. So, what see with him? With him, I'm a little nervous for him, and I would love to talk to him because he told on gang members, Bloods. Well, that and they're actually still very violent, and um, <laughs> and, you know, you, you know they 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 will shoot you in broad daylight. I mean, they don't give a shit. You know I mean? I, I was locked up with the Bloods. They're bad, man. Those kids are, I said, you give me some of these kids, I'll take a state over. They're bad. You know what I mean? So like, I'm a little nervous for him. Um, me, the mafia is not the same. And plus I was a shooter. I, I was capable of anything. You know, I don't know his background, what he was doing. I know he's young, but um, with the Bloods, you know what he's doing. I know he's successful. He's rich. I'm happy for him. I'm glad that he's out, changed his life. You know, he's seen the treachery in any organization. It's the same. But he just has to be careful as far as the five boroughs with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they are, um, they will kill you. That's for sure. Now, now the other thing is, is um, and I know it's a different family, but with, and I knew you grew up with the Gambinos. We didn't get to that, but check out right. the we'll put links to the podcast. But with a mob boss getting killed by some, you know, weirdo 24-year-old. Right. Now, and I get both sides, and I want to understand. Like, to me, I always think, that the fact that this kid is still in jail, like alive, or his family's still alive, he's got to remember there's whole Sicilian undertone. Well, they'll wipe over there. They'll wipe out your whole family, right? Like, it's just, right and they don't, they don't do that over here. Yeah. So, so ha like, what's gonna happen to that kid? Well, to that kid's family? Nothing. And they'll never bother the family. Maybe they'll blow the cars up, do something like that, just to get you know something like that. I can see because like I, Ronnie had me blow up a witnesses. Uh, uh, brother's car, stuff like that, you know, so I've done stuff like that, but not like actually hurt the person, but he had me set cars on fire that people were cooperating against him on his case and, um, his first case. And, um, but you're not supposed to go after the family. You can't hurt no innocent people. Yeah, women right, yeah. so they, they would never sanction that. They would never order that. You might get someone to do a, a like a rogue maniac boss that might say, do it on the low, yeah. sneak them, you yeah. know, something like that, because you're not supposed to, but just, just get them, sneak them. Don't let no one know that we did it. It won't be sanctioned. So they'll speak, right, they'll make it look like something random. But that kid, if he don't go to the feds and with his mafia guys, he'll be fine. No one's going to bother him in Jersey. You know what I'm saying? No one's really out there. You know what I'm saying? In a state jail, wherever he is, no one's going to bother him over there. He goes to the feds, yeah. no, he'll get dealt with. Interesting. Now, he'll get dealt with. now just to sort of get a more cur a personal curiosity, because uh, my family's from Italy, and, and I've been to Sicily, and, and I do think – there is a little difference between a Sicilian gangster right. and an Italian American gangster. Have you had much of run ins from guys from the other side, old school guys, that kind of stuff? Or was it more worried well, now by the time you came in? We actually don't like the zips. That's what we call them zips. Oh, wow. We can't stand them. We call them grease balls. We don't like them. We, we really don't. We can't stand them. They're around. We have them in our crew, like around us, but we don't like them. They, they're just different than us, you know what I'm saying? So we really didn't get along with them over here. At least I didn't. You know, they always like to have their little coffee shops and their little, uh, you know, that, that that stuff like that. We want card places. They're just more, um, more like cartoon characters. They wear like the whole suit still. You know, it's like a joke. <laughs> I'm not walking around with a fucking fedora and a cigar and a suit. I don't care. I tell my people like, Ronnie G wasn't like that. Ronnie's more of a Ronnie would never wear something like that. These guys are more like, um, you know, like like from the movies. You know what I mean? That's not what we were. Yeah. Wow. Now we're gonna wrap up soon, but I just have one or two more. So, so g give me one or two gangsters to this day that you came across that you still respect. Like no matter what, like listen, Tom, I call it like it is. These one or two people were the real deal. Who were they and why? And In my time? Yeah. I mean, like guys that I personally met, or just yeah. no. Yeah, personally, yeah. Uh, Vinny Asaro. Vinny Asaro. Vinny Asaro definitely is a, a gangster's gangster. And um, he is a mafia through and throughout. He will never change. That is his life. He went by the true code. He is def definition of a mobster, if you want to say. 
did he mess up? Did he, did he, uh, you know, break a lot of rules? He did, but he was a, a real gangster. Um, another one that I, I personally met that I would say, no joke, serious guy in my time, I would have to go with, I mean, I didn't personally know him. I'm trying to think I'll give you another good one. Cause a lot of the guys are younger yeah. and uh, they're not really like notor Nicky Carrazzo. Oh yeah, yeah. Nicky Carrazzo. I met him maybe once or twice, but I'm saying he, uh, he's a real serious, another mobster. He worked under my uncle Andy. He now, was, uh, um, I could say he's definitely a definition of a gangster also. Now conversely, give me one person who just like, you know, maybe publicly, it could be a little or before your time or during your time, who was a big name that was in the papers, but behind the scenes was like a like a joke, in your opinion. This may be John Jr. Who's that? John Gotti Jr. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. He's actually, he, he, people don't even realize that people used to make fun of him in my area. I swear to God, he was like, like when his father passed away, they were like jokes, that family. I swear to God, I'm not just saying it because I'm friends with Eli. I'm just being, I was best friends with the grandson. The younger grandson worked for me. They're like, they're, they should be actors. They want to be like, they, they just love like, that's that's their thing. He was like nothing. Like he just made he he lived behind his father. Uh, uh, he was like to me to everyone in the neighborhood. He was like a clown, you know. So okay, so now fast forward twenty twenty. You're turning your life around. You're actually start writing a book and doing stuff for yourself. But you're also, as I understand, doing some talks to kids or starting to right. do some outreach. Walk us through what twenty twenty looks like for you. Oh, it's a lot, man. I got a big documentary going on with uh, people from Italy. We're going to show uh, different families and all different guys that came up in the different families with this, uh, with this guy in uh, um, Italy. And um, right now, when the coronavirus is over, this whole thing, um, we're going to be doing our motivational speaks with kids in schools and stuff like that. Um, we got so much, I, I got so much stuff going on right now, man. It, it's crazy. It's overwhelming. I get hit up all over the, all over the world. People, you know, so happy and could relate to me and thank me and everything like that. So um, it's becoming pretty good, you know? Yeah, God bless. It's not, you know, it's not like you did it and then, you know, you're actually doing something to help. I mean, right. I think the coronavirus, and, and I know there's different opinions, do you think the coronavirus is hurting, hurting or helping the New York mob? Oh, hurting, definitely. Sports betting's off. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, bro that's a big income. Yeah. Sports betting, you kidding me? That's definitely hurting them. You think loan sharking come around though? You didn't get your PPP money? Uh -huh. Yeah, loans. Yeah. yeah, loans are still going good, but sports betting is like bread and butter. Yeah, that's the bread. Loan sharking is too, but sports is a big income for them, man. Big. Wow. And Gene, thank you. This is it's a Sunday, uh, folks, and and you know, it's obviously been the internet, but it's a Sunday. Thank you for taking your time. So, Gene, how can we find? We'll put some links, but how can we find you? Huh? Um, with, with me, uh, my Instagram is uh, geneboy six six six, and you could go to um. Uh, the Johnny Jean show is with the uh, crime flicks now. And um, you can see that on my uh, website, but also we have a lot of good guys coming on the show. Wild Bill's son. We have uh, Jimmy Colangelo. We got so many guys coming on. that want to talk with us and uh, a lot of ex good, good mob guys. And uh, we're trying to get um, um, Gravano. We're trying to get a bunch of guys that are probably going to come on and talk with us. You think you, you think you'll get Sammy? I, would, I, I can't see why not. You know what I'm saying? I would love to have him. He's a real deal thorough guy. And I, I think, uh, he could really give a good uh, a good talk with us. He's well, so I don't know. I don't know if I can get Karen on. Karen's a friend, um, right. and uh, she actually came when I launched a book in 2013. Her and Ramona came. I'm, I'm full disclosure. I'm personal friends uh, right. with Karen and Ramona. Shout out to them. Uh, hopefully they're doing, doing well. They open up a I, so. Like I said, I, it's not like I don't want non-violent guys on. I'm nothing against nobody. It doesn't do. But I'm more or less like guys that were really out there doing things. Like I would never invite Michael Francis. I would never want him on the show. I have nothing to talk to him about. I just don't. It what can we talk about? He's on the show, by the way. <laughs> yeah, like, what can we talk about? Like, I, he thinks I'm trying to get big off his name. My Uncle Andy makes him look like nothing. Like, you know, I don't care about that. I'm just saying, like, he, I just don't like that he don't keep it real, man. He tells he's 40 million a month. Listen to me. Nobody's making 40 fucking million dollars a month anywhere. So, like, I saw, that's what my beef is. You know, I'll never have him on my show. Me and Johnny don't want him on. But we're going to have a lot of good guys on and, um, that's it's taken off, man. A lot, a lot of people showing us love. That's exciting, man. We'll put the we'll put the uh, crime uh, link there as well. Uh, Gene, listen, uh, happy Sunday to you. Thanks for being on the show, and uh, thanks for yes. being on the New Theory podcast. All right, take care, fellas.